Hi there, this is Suzanne Atkinson, and you're listening to Triathlon Research Radio. I'd like to welcome you to today's podcast with Jay Johnson. Jay Johnson is a running coach in Boulder, Colorado. In this podcast, we learn about Jay's background as both a track and field athlete and as well as a run coach, and he takes us through his development of his coaching philosophy, including many of the influences that he's had during his life. Jay's an excellent guest to have on this podcast for a number of reasons. He's currently an author for Running Times Magazine. He also writes for Active.com. Jay shares with us three things that all triathletes should be doing before and after every run that don't take up much time at all. And these three things are really going to influence the ability to create maximum aerobic benefits in terms of VO2 max as well as help prevent injury. So I hope to stay tuned and learn more from Jay as I learn more about him and learn about his coaching philosophy. Hi, this is Mark Allen, six-time Ironman Triathlon World Champion and author of The Art of Competition. Do you want to transform your entire experience in the sport of triathlon? If you do, come put that transformation in place at the Triathlon Research High Performance Camp in Boulder, Colorado from August 25th through 29th. I'll be there for the closing day of this amazing camp, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be a part of it. I'll be presenting some thought-provoking insights from my most recent book, The Art of Competition, where I will show you how you can get more out of the sport and how you can transfer those principles to all areas of your life. I'll also be there for the entire day's worth of workouts for the grand finale of your five days exploring and experiencing new levels in your triathlon performance. If you sign up for the Triathlon Research Camp, you'll get a free copy of my book, which I'll be happy to sign for you at the dinner that we'll all share together on the closing day. The Triathlon Research Camp is going to be incredible. To take part in this once-in-a-lifetime experience, go to triathlonresearch.org backslash camp. But please hurry, as spots are going to be limited so that we can provide you with the best possible personal coaching experience. Welcome to Triathlon Research, the podcast that brings together the world's best triathlon coaches, athletes, equipment experts, and medical professionals to get you the right information that you need to race past your personal best and get more enjoyment out of your triathlon journey. Triathlon Research, where we teach you how to train smart. Here's your host, Suzanne Atkinson, MD, founder and head coach of Steel City Endurance. Hi there, this is Suzanne Atkinson with Triathlon Research Podcast, and today I'm interviewing Jay Johnson in Boulder, Colorado. How are you today, Jay? I'm, I'm good, Suzanne. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us today. I know you've got a busy day ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to to talk to the triathlon world. I spend my time in, in the world of, of running, so this this is going to be fun. Great. Well, just to give you guys a little bit of a background about Jay, Jay is primarily a runner and a running coach. And Jay, you can correct me if I uh, have anything incorrect here. Jay started off his run coaching career in uh, Pratt Community College in Pratt, Kansas, and then moved to CU in Boulder, Colorado. Now, Jay, you're currently running training camps for high school athletes and their coaches and also doing some writing for two different running outlets. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I write frequently for, for running time. So I think that's saying that I'm a contributor to, to running times, which is far and away the most, I, I don't want to say science-based, but it's 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 the, the magazine that, that serious runners read. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously there's runner's world out there. And it's cool because I'm about to offend Runner's World, but because they're owned by the same company, I, I don't it's think okay. they can be, be, be too offended. You, you know, if you're out there and you really want to understand running, you can buy Running Times. I think it's $12 for a year. It's, it's really great information. And then I do some writing for Active.com. Mm-hmm. And many people maybe have used Active.com to sign up for races, but Active.com also writes or presents articles. And I write some articles for them. Those articles are a little more for the recreation runner. Mm-hmm. Whereas the running times article, we can assume that the person understands some training theory and just has a, a higher level of understanding of running training. So you're writing specifically to two different audiences when you 
pen your articles for each outlet. Yes. You know, my, my blog is coachjjohnson.com and that's probably the most specific writing I, I do. I mean, you know, in, yeah. anybody in, in this day and age can have a blog mm-hmm. and I really don't water down any of, of that content. You know, I, I could see how somebody who's new to running could come and read some of those articles and not quite understand them. But but actually the post I wrote today was just a very simple one about overtraining mm-hmm. and trying to make sure that we're not overtrained, that, that we need to value being undertrained, which I think is maybe counterintuitive for a lot of athletes. Um, my brief understanding of the triathlon world is, is that a lot of athletes are overtrained. And so trying to trust this idea that, you know, more is not always the better course, I, mm-hmm. I think is, is hard sometimes. Yeah, that's definitely a common theme. And personally, for me as an athlete, I go through that over and over, uh, not always intentionally, where I'm feeling pretty good with my training. And I think that, you know, maybe I'll push it a little bit. I'm 45 years old and I keep wanting to feel like I did when I was 25. And I don't know if that'll ever happen, but what I end up doing is just a little too much for a couple days in a row. And then, boy, do I pay for it if I don't recover. You know, right. so that, that would be in a, a case of kind of shorter term overtraining. But what it does is impacts my ability to be consistent for the next two, three, four, five days while I'm recovering from whatever silly things I did. I really love that you bring up the idea of consistency. I have a a site, the thing I'm most excited about right now is an educational site for high school running coaches. So these are coaches who coach uh, high school cross country and track, and it's simply called highschoolrunningcoach.com. But what we're doing is featuring a coach each month. And the first coach is one of the best coaches in the country. And when I asked him on a podcast, what's the most important variable that that he thinks he sees not only in his program's training, but that he sees in other programs is consistency. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about consistency week to week, month to month. And then, you know, he he gives his athletes some, a couple weeks off after each season. So they're basically training, you know, and and again, these are our younger athletes. Sure. They're, They're training 48 weeks a year. Mm-hmm. But his point is, if you're consistent with your training within those 48 weeks a year, you're going to get very fit and you're going to run fast. And I, I think consistency, when, when you talk to elite level runners um, and elite athletes, is something that they always are, are coming back to. You know, I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but it's exactly what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. This idea that over the course of two or three days, they train a little bit too hard, but then they need to back off for four or five days. <laughs> so it's this idea of two steps forward, yeah. but unfortunately four steps back, right. where you would be better <laughs> off taking you know, a third of a step or a half of a step every day for day upon day. Yeah, that's so true. And, uh, you know, I've gone through several cycles myself of not doing much training for a while. You know, I I think I am in my head. I'm kind of fooling myself that, you know, walking to the coffee shop, which is two blocks away and back is some kind of exercise. But, you know, if I've been out of exercise for a while and then I get back into it and I start ramping up for some event that may be three, four, even six months in the future, I've learned over time that for me personally, I'm much better off doing what I call just going through the motions. So let's just suppose that I was going to do a 25-minute circuit weight routine just to wake up some muscles I haven't been using. I will go through the physical motions without using any weights at all because that's going to get me moving, get my range of motion going, get some blood flow going. And I know 100% for sure that I'm not going to feel sore the next day. And then I can, you know, continue that process. And whether it's running, biking, or swimming, the same sort of thing. I always try to undershoot my what I think I can do on the first day by at least 50 to 60% because I know for sure that I'm going to enjoy it better and feel good afterwards and I can go back and do it again. Yeah, great, great. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, one of the things I'm known for in the running world is to do a lot of, however you want to term it, ancillary training or ancillary training. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that. Yeah, so so we can talk about that. The bottom line is, I mean, I, I think sometimes after we've trained hard, we just need to do some things to encourage blood flow, to get those large muscle groups to get some blood back to them because as we know blood Mm -hmm. is oxygen rich and we want to get oxygen to those areas sure that's how recovery and healing happens right yeah you mentioned already that let's talk a little bit about some of the ancillary stuff that you do and then we can sort of build into more specific things with running and how that applies to triathletes sure the first time, I think I'd run across your blog in the past year or so, just on my own, looking at different things. Because when I went there the second time, it looked familiar. Okay. And the reason I went there the second time was to check out the Myrtle routine. Okay. Yep. Is the Myrtle routine uh, far and away your most popular 
routine for runners, or is or is that a yes. little bit something that you give to? No, that, that that's hands down the, the the most popular. And the the background on that is, um, I produced a DVD with my friend Mike Smith, who coaches at Kansas State University, and I was a coach at the University of Colorado uh, for six years. And Mike was in in the same conference in the Big Twelve conference. I was the, mm-hmm. the middle distance coach at the University of Colorado, and his athletes to put it simply, were much faster than my athletes. <laughs> you know, this this doesn't always happen in track and field, but in, in this situation, Mike was re- willing to share everything with me, down to mm-hmm. the macro cycle for the year, what the year looks like, what the meso cycle looks like, what a session looks like. You know, so I, w- I would talk to him at meets. I mean, when, when we were both in beautiful endurance capitals like Lincoln, Nebraska or Stillwater, Oklahoma, I would go over to his hotel and, and chat with him about things. So I, I learned a lot from him. So we, we produced this DVD, but the problem was in the DVD, some of the exercises he was doing, you needed a partner. So I wanted to come yeah. up with, with routines, a routine of, let's say, 10 exercises that somebody could do on their own. So Myrtle mm-hmm. just is a cheesy term to remind people that we're focused on the uh, hip girdle area. So basically, mm-hmm. you know, and some people could, could say this is core strength, but it, it's really mobility around the hips. And so um, I've done some work for Nike, and Nike filmed this. And I, I, th- I think if you Google Myrtle, the, the, the first YouTube video will, will be that video. But then I, I've mm-hmm. also shared it with with the Running Times, and probably the thing that that your reader. I don't know if we can put put a link under under this. Uh, you know how how this is is posted on your website, but there there's an eight week general strength progression that I have for runners where it's simply broken down into easy days and hard days. So for the first mm-hmm. four weeks on your easy day, you're doing Myrtle after your run. And once okay. you learn the exercises in Myrtle, it's probably going to take, I would say, seven minutes, eight minutes, something like that. And uh-huh. the irony, of course, is I don't do Myrtle with athletes I coach very much. Athletes that I coach in Boulder are a little more advanced. But, um, yeah. but Myrtle is is definitely a, a nice routine to, to, to get some mobility in the hips. You could use it before your workout, but primarily people are using it af- after their workout. And now, then the other thing that if you if you Google the lunge matrix, so the simple contribution I've, I've had over the last few years is that you would do the lunge matrix before your run. My lunge matrix is rooted in physical therapist Gary Gray's okay. work. Gary Gray does all kinds of different lunge matrixes for different athletes, golfers, basketball players, what, what have you. Interesting. My lunge matrix is just five five different exercises adds up to 50 lunges we've timed it numerous times regardless of skill mm-hmm. level it takes three and a half minutes okay and then there's some some leg swings that you can do on a fence or next to a car just just some place where, where you can put your hand up to the side of your body and that takes 90 seconds so what we're looking at is a five minute warm-up prior to your run and and the question people often have is well why wouldn't I run a little bit and then do lunges uh-huh. it's just something that you've got to trust it for about two weeks and then those lunges become easy yeah and then by week four you, you'll feel odd if you went out for a run with without doing the the lunge matrix prior to it well I think it's that's a really important point is that when you're incorporating something like this, first of all, you've pointed out a couple of really key features. Number one, not everyone needs it, but a lot, an awful lot of people do. And I think that triathletes, for the most part, are probably more likely than your elite runners you work with to need this because we've got day jobs. Most people work full time and so much of our time is spent sitting uh, in the car in front of the computer. And as triathletes, the majority of the training time is spent on the bike where you're in a flexed position, you know, hips flexed, knees flexed, ankles exactly. flexed, anteriorly uh, rotated in the in the scapula. And so this, the simple Myrtle routine, the first couple times I did it, I thought, wow, that's a workout in itself. Just because there are motions that are opposite of what I do on a daily routine basis. But as my body got accommodated to it, it felt easier and easier. And now I feel really good while I'm doing it. And I look forward to doing cool. it. Cool. Well, um, well, well, well yeah. that's, that, that, that's really, really cool feedback to think that, and this is just shows the, the educational value in, in this interview f- for me, not thinking about somebody being in that flexion position on the bike mm-hmm. 
and this is probably the point where people just need to Google it and see it, right? <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> right. Everyone's like, what are you, what are you talking, talking about? about? Right. But, but, but there's some, you know, so some of the, the starting starting positions, if you've ever done yoga and done the uh, table position where you basically mm-hmm. have your hands under your shoulders, your knees under your hips, so your back is flat. And then I, I, I think that's what you're saying would be a, a position that, that is not something that the triathlete is normally in. Well, from that point, that starting point, then doing the extension, like yep. the donkey kick or yep. the, yeah, and, and using the posterior muscles. Groups. Yeah, and you know, one thing with Myrtle too is that we can link to this is when I first started doing this with athletes, I didn't quite understand the best way to do it. So the, the Nike video of this, the athlete who's a warm and I used to coach Sarah Vaughn, she's got too much ex- hyper extension of her back when she's doing the, the, mm-hmm. the donkey kick exercise. So now we, yeah. we just kick our leg legs straight back. But I think at some point in this interview, we'll talk about the camp that we're doing in Boulder. So we'll, yeah. we'll definitely be teaching it the correct way at camp. Yeah. You know, we've got a, listeners of, a, of the full spectrum of triathlon experience and ability from people that are just starting and they're really attracted to the the technique focus that we have, the technique emphasis. But we also have, you know, IT races and professionals that listen into the to the podcast. Okay. So yeah, so it's a really great range. But I think what's fundamental to every single one of those people is that, you know, I try to really focus on on pure, like good technique that is anatomically correct and kinesthetically correct, if that makes yes. sense. And then on, you know, scientifically based training principles. So this routine, you've already mentioned three or four other coaches' names that inspired you to help create it and helped you actually produce the DVD. You know, I just see that the all there's all this common knowledge and support that comes together and it creates something, you know, with a goofy name like the murder routine. And I can't tell you how many athletes I've recommended that to since learning about it. Right. So I, I really appreciate this community aspect and the the fact that we all learn from each other and we build on each other's skills to to create little nuggets of knowledge for our athletes so that everybody can benefit from yeah. it. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your own background because I like to hear stories about how people got where they are today. So in in listening to your your current bio, writing articles for Running Times and active.com and running a website for high school triathlon coaches, that's a pretty high level of, of coaching skill. But let's rewind the clock here. Do you remember your very first running race? Yeah, I do. It was a field day <laughs> in about second or third grade, and I was running the hurdles anatomically. My my legs are pretty long. I'm, I'm, I'm 5'11", but I have fairly long legs and a short torso. So mm-hmm. I don't know how that translates to the triathlon world, but You'd be a fast biker yeah, too, probably. All right. You might struggle with the swim a little, yeah. but I could help you. With oh, that. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So I, I ran in high school. I was good enough to walk on at the University of Colorado. I grew up in Castle Rock, Colorado. I ran four twenty-five for the sixteen hundred. So, mm-hmm. wow. so that would equate to about four nineteen for, for sea level. You know, if, if I had grown uh-huh. up somewhere else, and so, so that meant that I, I was just—I I wasn't a scholarship athlete, but I was somebody that they wanted on on the team. Okay, I was on the team for five years. There's a book called Running with the. Buffaloes. The Buffaloes. Yeah. I, that, that was my fifth year that that book was written. And I was actually in grad school that year studying kinesiology and uh, applied physiology. And as many of you know in the sport, uh, Neil Henderson, who is a very well respected coach, he and I were, were in the same, same graduate program at that time. Okay. Yeah. I ran 1420 for 5K. I ran 349 for 1500. I hate my 10K PR because it's 30, it's, <laughs> it's 30, 15. You know, if I could. Uh-huh. Could just have run fifteen sec- or sixteen seconds faster. And you want to get the sixteen seconds been, off. Been under <laughs> under thirty minutes. Uh-huh. But but yeah, I was fortunate enough to be on on good cross country teams, even though I w- I wasn't really a, a great cross country runner. And mm-hmm. then from there, I, I went to coach at Pratt Community College. Did you know when you were at CU that you wanted to become a running yes, coach? Yes, yes. At, at, at that point, somewhere around my junior or senior year undergrad, I knew I wanted, wanted to coach. I was on kind of a pre-med track. Then I had taken the dental admissions test and thought I wanted, wanted to be a dentist for a while. Mm-hmm. But then I, I, I knew I wanted to coach. At that time, if you wanted to be a college coach, you really need to have a master's, so it made sense to just enter that master's program. Sure. I don't know if everybody understands this, but you basically have five years to complete four years of eligibility. For NCAA athletes? Yeah, so if if you get hurt one year, then you can still graduate in four years, but then come back for for that fifth year and, and compete. 
So Mm -hmm. probably the busiest year of my life was that fifth year where, (laughs) you know, I was, I was a teaching assistant. I was going, you know, I was, I was in grad school and I I hadn't run well the last couple of years, but my my fifth year of running was, was probably my, my best year of of running at CU. So it was your, your busiest year time-wise, but also your best year of running. How, what do you attribute well, that to? Well, yeah, and if you go back earlier, I mean, I ran 1420 for 5K as a sophomore in college, mm-hmm. and I was taking organic chemistry and physics, <laughs> and uh, that that was the most intense year academically as an undergrad. So I, I was fortunate, and, and I, I do think this is fortunate. Some people are going to laugh at this. I mean, you know, we'd go to bed at 9.30 on a Saturday night because we'd have a, a, a 20-mile long run on, on Sunday morning. And so right. my life was basically running in school. Yep. That transitioned a little bit. I met a woman who, you know, I'd eventually marry. I met her um, towards the end of my undergrad, and we were, we were dating grad school. So there was a little more balance for, from a social standpoint there. Uh-huh. But, but the majority of those five years running at CU, it was pretty much just run and, and try and, and work academically. So your best performance in your fifth year, it sounds to me like you're simply attributing to the fact that you had consistent training all that time and you just built from one year to the next to the next. Yeah, I mean, I I was older. I mean, I I was smarter about training. I was willing on some of the, I had learned at that point the workouts I was good at and the workouts I I was bad at. And I really, Uh you know, some people say, oh, you've got to improve the things that that you're not good at. And I I really don't agree with that, at least at, at that level of training. So for instance, we would do this 10 mile run on, on the Boulder Creek path. And these times won't sound fast to people who are at, at, at sea level, but you know, <laughs> I'd maybe run 57 minutes for 10 miles. So maybe, I don't know, what is that like five, five forty five pace. And there is a, a pretty mm-hmm. big hill at, at the end of it. You'd go uphill. If you've been in Boulder, it's, it's just the, the path that parallels Broadway going from the Creek path back, back up to campus. Uh-huh. But I'd have teammates who could run 53 minutes, 54 minutes. And I, I just think on those workouts, I just, I would run hard, but I, I wouldn't treat it like, like a race on the yeah. long runs. It was, it was the same idea, but earlier in my career, I treated, you know, a 20 mile run in the middle of, you know, running 85 miles a week in single runs at, at, at that time, running twice a day, wasn't really valued in the program until you were running basically more than 85 miles a week in single runs. Okay. Yeah, so that, that was a twenty mile run on Sunday. was was part of that eighty five miles, and 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 my my two best friends on the team, Zeke Tiernan and, and Chris Severy, were really good at the twenty mile run. So I wanted to be able to run with them. But in retrospect, mm-hmm. my my biomechanics are probably more of a a, a fifteen hundred meter runners. I, I have a little more of a, a, a verticality to my stride. Okay, you know, a ten thousand meter runner or a marathoner. Is is a little lower, lower to the ground, and a little more uh, efficient that way. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, so I, so I might have been better off with like a sixteen or a seventeen mile long run each week, and I probably would have been better off focusing just on the track workouts as my hard days. Then again, on some of these ten mile hard runs, just maybe running like sixty minutes or you know five fifty five 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 fifty pace for ten miles. Just in retrospect, it was something I, I wasn't very good at. But but I, I started to figure those things out my, my, my fifth year. <laughs> so the, a lot of experience and just being more mature, like you said. Yeah. You know, in all college programs, it's somewhat template-based in terms of there's a general structure to what the training is going to look like week to week, month to month, or season to season. And so if you're better at the 1,500 or you're right. better at the 10,000, my theory is you know, the first two years of a college training program, somebody should mm-hmm. just immerse themselves in it and run hard every time they're asked to run hard. But then in an ideal world, I think the coach and the athlete would sit down at the beginning of, of the junior uh-huh. year and say, all right, we've figured out you're not good at these track workouts. Why don't you just kind of get through those, but, mm-hmm. but not try and grind those out? <laughs> and the flip side is you're really good at the long run. Let's try and do a, yeah. a progression long run where – 10 miles control, yeah. five miles a little faster than five miles hard, you know, so, so you're getting your 20 mile run in that way. So it sounds like um, in those first two years that what the coach is doing is looking for the people that are naturally better at the shorter distances, the track stuff, or at least just helping to use that to segregate people so that they can then specialize. No, no, no. Okay. No, well I'm, then I, I no, misinterpreted that. Not. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah well, what, what I'm saying is that that would be the, the ideal. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens in basically no, no, in no program in, in virtually no, no programs. Is that happening? Okay. But, but I, I but I do think that would yeah. be the, the ideal. Well, let it, me tell you what happens. was going on in my mind as you were describing that. And maybe this is why I misinterpreted things a little bit, but in triathlon, you know, a, a triathlon is a run, bike and swim. Um, but it could be something else. Oh, and wow. you know, winter triathlons can be, um, uh, snowshoe, cross country ski, and uh, dog sled. Okay. You know, it's it's very flexible in that there are sanctioned races by USA Triathlon, and there are several other corporations, you know, World Triathlon Corporation, and then there's the ITU Racing Circuit, where there are you know specific distances and competitions for prize money. But on a much lighter level, a triathlon coming into the sport as the first year triathlete, you know, we could uh, say as a freshman. There, there are really no rules. I mean, it's as they're adults usually coming into the sport. Most often, a lot of people arrive at triathlon after maybe they've had a running career and now their knees or their hips are bothering them, or maybe they don't have time to do their 20 mile weekend runs or whatever it was that they had been doing. So people come to triathlon usually as uh, an adult, usually out of college and are looking for where they fit in. So I, one of the things that I think is important is that you, you fit in wherever you are right now. There's no standard that you have to live up to. And if you're doing your first year of triathlon and you try your first sprint and you think that was a lot of fun and you try an Olympic and that was a lot of fun, some people feel like they have to go to the longer distances. I have to do a half Ironman or I have to do an Ironman or else I'm not a triathlete. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with the distances, but a, an Ironman triathlon is 140.6 miles total. And there's going to be some people who are naturally inclined to the shorter distances, you know, if for no other reason than that's what their physiology and their muscle makeup and their their personality matches. People, some people like to go fast. They like to do hard training and they may be time limited. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with becoming a fast sprint distance triathlon racer. And I think that's real important for people to understand that there's no there's no should in triathlon. There's nothing that you should do. It's whatever you want to make the sport out to be. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think we, what what I see with the, the adult clients I coach is that you know sometimes they're they're so focused on marathon training, which does require these long long runs on the weekends, and an ideal world would, would require more mileage. And I, I've had a few very savvy athletes say. You know, I, I want to run one marathon a year because the 16 weeks leading up to that are going to be intense. But I would rather run 5Ks and, and 10Ks the, the rest of the year. Or for a fit athlete, you can even run a half marathon mm -hmm. and not have to do the, the, the same volume of, of training to run well. You know, I, I know that in running and I can assume in triathlon that this idea that the longest uh, competitive the longest competitive distance is what everybody should be doing. Right. Um, I think that's probably a problem that it, it would be great to correct. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think you bring up a really good point about just just people's uh, normal disposition. They're kind of their mental makeup, there's just like you said, there's nothing wrong with being excited about going fast for a, for a short amount of time. And it's not like the, the training is any less focused for that mm -hmm. task. Right, exactly. It's just specific. We just think that the only people that are really trying hard are the people doing the longest event, and I just I, I, I don't think that's true. Well, one of my one of my hardest working athletes that I coach online is somebody who just likes five k road races. We'll do a half marathon, we'll do a ten k, but he really wants to run the five k fast. But the training he's doing is just mm -hmm. as serious as any marathon athlete I coach. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's important for people to realize. You can take triathlon to whatever level that you personally feel it's going to fit into your life. Right. Um, you know, as a coach, I, I try to strive that balance is important and everyone's going to have different priorities. Right. You know, you even mentioned in your fifth year at, at CU, you, you were dating the woman who you later married and that provided some social balance to your life. And yet you still perform better that year than any other year. Yeah. Well, that, that was an interesting year too, where it, it definitely opened my eyes to, uh, if I had a bad workout, I was too busy to dwell on it because I had to go grade papers, go study, or wanted to go have have, have a meal with, with Laura. Now, the asterisk is she lived with this guy, Chris Lear, who, who wrote that book. Yeah. So there were a couple of surreal times where we did the workout, and he had written his notes, and he had written like a rough draft of what he thought that workout was. He's like, Jay, how does this the, the, the sound to you? And it was the craziest thing because I'm – 
he's standing near the head coach and the assistant coach and I'm listening to, you know, him read what their comments were about the workout. Um, so, so that was, was, was pretty interesting, but, but, but just to go back to the important point, yeah. which is I've seen in athletes who have careers and, and especially who have children that it's easier to blow off bad workouts in the athletes I've coached that don't have one or, or both of those things going on, mm -hmm. it's easier to really dwell on a bad workout and to let it influence the, the next workout and to, to just not be in a very good mental state in, in, in between a bad workout and the next workout uh, on tap. That impacts your the rest of your life. Yeah, you know, if you're in a bad mood exactly. because you had a bad workout, your friends are going to be bummed out. They're not going to want to hang out with you. Yeah. And you're not yeah. going to... You're not going to be present for your job or your family or your spouse or, or whatever it is. I've personally, you know, when I'm doing training the three different um, triathlon sports, swimming is, is probably by far and away the most satisfying to me in that I have um, more consistently good swim sessions than I do run or bike sessions. All right. And so it almost doesn't matter what I do in the pool. I just feel so awesome when I'm in the pool. I'm enjoying it so much. And, you know, a quote unquote bad swim for me still makes me feel great and I'm happy to get in the pool again the next day and do something new or try the same thing again. But I can relate to the experience of a bad workout because of the three sports running is the one that I've always um, struggled with the most. And I feel like it's a constant uh, project for me. I'm constantly working on my mo mobility. I'm constantly trying to balance cardiovascular fitness versus some of the, uh, you know, run drills to get my coordination down. You know, I'm not playing soccer or ultimate like I did when I was much younger. So the, the play aspect is gone. And so for me, when I think about, oh, maybe I'll, you know, do that run that's on my training schedule for tomorrow, I have a, a whole day of anxiety leading up to it. You know, right. <laughs> like, I, how's it going to go? Is it going to be fun? Am I going to feel great afterwards? And, you know, if I have that one really great run, I want to get that feeling back again. And I'm not always sure how to do that. Yeah. Um, so I can appreciate both, both sides. Do you have any um, mental skills tricks that you use with your athletes to um, help them deal with situations like that? I think the long run is probably the place where it, it crops up up the most. One thing in, in the training I do with adults is we, we do a long run each week that, that I try and get them to buy into the idea that that's the most important workout each week. And so if I look, I, I want to share something about the week before I go back to, to the long run. Mm -hmm. The other workout in the week would be, usually it falls on Tuesday. Some athletes might have two workouts a week on Tuesday and Thursday. Some athletes, it's Wednesday. But here's the bottom line. Yeah, sure. I keep those workouts short and sweet. So it doesn't mean, like, they're hard, but they don't last very long. And so even somebody uh -huh. training for the marathon isn't running more than about 75 minutes for that workout. The one, I, I do like that workout that many of you are familiar with, the, the Yasso 800s, which is 800s with a 400 jog. That, that's the one workout that, you know, mm -hmm. you have to plan another half hour in your day because it just takes a while to, to do the 800s and, yeah, and to do those jogs. So I, I don't see people struggling mentally, usually with those workouts in terms of, you know, how do I, I psych myself up for it? Or what do I do if I'm not feeling well? I mean, they tend to have it dialed in there. I think once they buy into the idea of the long run going well, let's say it's a 15 mile long run mm -hmm. and I'm asking them to, I, I really like like uh, uh, progression long runs. So that that's simply a run that gets faster towards the end of the run. Mm -hmm. So in a progression long run that's 15 miles, if, if you're advanced, you maybe run eight miles really easy then two miles where you get a little faster, and then you're trying to maintain a nice, a nice strong pace uh, for those last five miles. And that's something that what I'm trying to teach is if you get to the eight-mile mark and you don't feel well, then mm -hmm. just keep running those next seven miles. If you get to the eight-mile mark and you speed up for a couple miles and now you're at 10 and you don't feel well, mm -hmm. then just run those last five miles. If you can execute it the way we've written it, that's obviously the ideal day. Mm -hmm. But over, you know, and again, we wouldn't do this workout four weeks in yeah. a row, but just for, for, um, for argument's sake here, probably one, one long run out of four. So once a month, the person mentally is just going to feel drained and it, it's, it's not going to make sense. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think sometimes in training, you know, what, what if we were to imagine that our coach sent us training on a piece of paper and it was written in pencil. 
Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So yeah, sure does. So then you you could you could erase what's in pencil very easily and put in a different workout for that day. Now yeah. that's much different than getting an email or looking at some you know online cool calendar database whatever <laughs> it is because it feels yeah. like that workout is set in stone and it, and you have to do it that way. I think when people really take their training to to the next level. And I can't comment on on the other two aspects of triathlon, but I know from the run portion, you know, you can really dig yourself a hole if you try and grind out a long run or grind out a long workout if if you're not feeling well. Yeah. And so just understanding, okay, I need to run this by feel. I'm not going to pay attention to the, 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 the <laughs> GPS. Yeah. This is a tangent we could talk about. I'm not a big fan of heart rate monitors, but but in this situation, if the heart rate monitor is going crazy and I'm way out of the zone I wanted to be in, let's dial it back and get into that zone that that I was that that my my coach told me to be in. You know, but but having basically the first yeah. word that comes to mind is courage. That might be too strong a word, but having the courage to say, you know what? Yeah, I don't feel well today. I'm going to have to dial it back. That means running slower and getting back in, into a, an effort level that's appropriate for that day. So I think that takes two things. It, it takes a mature athlete, mm-hmm. and then it also takes somebody who just really understands that that the purpose of training is not to just grind things out, but to improve your aerobic system. And the way you improve your aerobic system yeah. is to definitely train hard enough so that there's a, a metabolic change going on, but not one that you can't recover from. I think this is where, and again, I don't want to speak out of turn since I'm not a triathlon coach, but this is where I, I would think that some triathletes get into some trouble is they, they rock a run workout or a bike workout or have a great swim workout, right. but it 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 didn't set them up. It was It was too hard. And now they're not set up to to do the the next hard workout. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. And um, I think what's really important about that athlete that you say is taking that that pencil workout and making a change on the fly based on how they feel. It's important that athlete recognizes that that's a successful workout. Yes, you know, the, exactly. The success. The successful workout is not doing exactly what the coach said. The successful workout, <laughs> much more yeah. succinctly and better said than, 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 I, than I. Exactly. What, what yeah. Is, well, you know, what is the definition of a, of a successful workout? I think you're exactly right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it, it, and it's just so. It takes a lot of. Um, for some athletes, it takes a lot of reassurance and a lot of time and education and a lot of back and forth feedback between the coach and the athlete. Uh, for them to understand that and and honestly start to believe that, yeah, you know, it, and in working with with adults, I see the whole spectrum of some people that really want to they want to be told what to do, and if they're not told exactly what to do, they they just don't know what to do for whatever reason. Maybe they're busy making decisions all day in their their other life. You know, maybe they've got a law practice, or maybe they're a surgeon, and they're the whole day is busy making decisions, and they just want to be told what to do. You know, that's one type of athlete, and that's fine. Another type of athlete has is more mature, like you described, and understands their body. Usually they've had more years of experience training, either in college or as a high school athlete, and they feel more comfortable making those changes, but it's because they've they've been educated and they've gone through a long process of communicating with, with a coach or a mentor that, you know, this is okay and this is what's best for me. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about, I want to be sure we save time to talk about the camp coming up. But I, would, I just want to get a little bit of your philosophy as well about running. You mentioned a minute or two ago about not being a big fan of heart rate monitors, and you, you mentioned a GPS as well. You didn't tell us how you felt about that. But what's your general philosophy about using perceived exertion versus heart rate and uh, and how athletes should manage intensity? Yeah, I, I, I would take it to, to some semantics that are even more basic than that, and I would say you need to learn to run by feel, mm-hmm. okay? So you know, there, there's a threshold between training aerobically and going into your anaerobic m- metabolism. Mm-hmm. And everybody who's done a hard track workout knows what that feels like. And, and please excuse me for not knowing what, what the bike and swim analogies to that is. But I, it's, um, it's similar enough in, in time wise, you know, if you're doing track repeats that take, you know, six minutes, there are equivalent workouts for bike and swim. Right. And so the idea is I'm trying to teach athletes. So so I'll use fartlek workouts. And again, whether it's with high school athletes where I'm trying to, to help them train in more intelligently, or it's a 50-year-old marathoner who 
doesn't think they can break the Boston time that they ran at 41, but knows they can run well in their age group at Boston. Okay. Mm -hmm. In both situations, we're going to spend the first month of training doing fartlek workouts for a lot of our workouts. And then even later on, I, I have a couple athletes now who ran Boston and now we're getting ready for fall marathons. And we might have a 70 minute workout where we warm up and cool down about 10 minutes. We might have 20 minutes in the middle that is at a steady pace and then maybe have some fart look in the middle where it's two minutes at, at an on pace. So that might be 5K pace. And then mm -hmm. one minute steady in between. And then two minutes on. So the bottom line is, and I just got done presenting at a high school clinic th this past week where one of my slides was, it's okay if they crash and burn. <laughs> it, 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 it's okay if you run one of these fartlek workouts and you just, I mean, you run way too hard yeah. Be, because the next time you do it, you're going to become, you're going to get closer to executing it the right way. And mm -hmm. the, the third time you do it, you'll probably have it dialed in. Now, yeah. I always have athletes who are saying, well, what, what, what time should I run? You know, what, what should my paces be? Or, you, you know, it's a hilly course. What, what should my paces be then? I say, I say just run by feel. Be, mm -hmm. Because I think it's so important to learn how to run by feel rather than say, okay, I'm going to, to, to run by, by what my watch says. Now, you know, leading up to a marathon, if you've done a half marathon six weeks out, you know, you, you run the half marathon, at a, you know, you execute a good race plan, then you can put that time into some of these calculators, get a feel for marathon pace, really dial in marathon pace. But, but this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about training a, a appropriately and having a successful workout. If you learn to run by feel, you know, mm -hmm. a workout you did in week one and then you replicate in week five, you might do mm -hmm. it a minute slower in week five. You know, sure. or, or, I'm sorry, over the course of 60 minutes, you might r run 0.4 miles less, right? So, so the overall pace was a little bit slower, but uh -huh. you, you might have gotten the appropriate stimulus for that day. Right, so, because so, you overran it the first time. Yeah, so, so I basically have, have two key things, and, and one should be obvious for triathletes, which is develop the aerobic metabolism. So you always want to be becoming a better aerobic athlete, but that's, that's not a problem for, for triathletes. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what, what all the training is pointed towards. It's all aerobic, yeah. It's all aerobic. And so <laughs> when you look at, at what do you specifically want to do run-wise, I think you want to run by feel. So then this brings up the issues of heart rate monitors and, and GPS watches, which is they're not bad tools. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about GPS watches first. A, a GPS watch is a good tool on the hard days and the long runs. But mm -hmm. I, I think on your easy days, you know how far your loop is. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> like, like you, you, know what, you know how far the loop that usually takes you 50 minutes is. And if you go yeah. do it and it takes 51.30 someday, that's not a bad run. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I've coached people before that had PRs for their easy days. Well, that, uh -huh. that is dumb <laughs> training. You should never have a PR for your easy day. Maybe, maybe that's too harsh, but you shouldn't want to PR on your easy day, right? You, right. Yeah. yeah, it depends where the athlete is in their development. If it's a newer athlete, they're going to have a really steep, you know, I'll call it a learning curve, but it's a fitness curve where maybe every time they go out, is it, it is a PR, but it's just because they're making such rapid improvement. But right. the, the goal, as you said, should be to run by feel. So if it's an easy run, yeah. I'm going to make it feel easy, and the pace is what it, what it is. Yep. Yep, exactly. So, so those are, are, are the, the two big things that, that I would highlight. And then, you know, everything else that I'm about to mention is important, but develop the aerobic metabolism and learn to run by feel, trump everything else I'm about to say. And yet, okay. whoever is listening to this will probably want to do these things. All right. Mm -hmm. So, you need to be doing strides at basically 5K pace. All right. 5K pace is faster than, than the pace that you're normally working out at. A stride can be 20 or 30 seconds running at 5K pace. You can take about 60 seconds in between. A lot of the assignments I have for runners on their easy days, and again, these are adults with careers, with families, their easy day on a Monday might be a 50-minute run and then putting in five by 20 or 30 seconds at 5K pace with that, that 60 second in, in between. So it's mm -hmm. just part of your 50 minute run. You, you know, you're just speeding up, 
to run 5K pace and you're slowing down to a nice easy jog, then, then speeding up again. The reason you want to do that is you want the neuromuscular system to be stimulated at a little higher level than if, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Olympic distance has a, a, a 10K as the run yes. portion. Okay. Yeah, it's so, a, you, yeah, yeah, after a 24 mile bike. Yeah, so, so the idea is if you get off the bike at the Olympic distance and you want to run a 10K, you want your body to have run faster than that on easy days so that that 10K pace doesn't feel fast. Sure. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so, it does. So, so that's one thing. Um, I definitely believe in general strength and mobility. And so at the beginning of this podcast, we referred to this eight-week general strength progression I have. We can link to that, and in, in it's, it's at running times. Or mm-hmm. um, you know, if you just Googled eight-week general strength progression and then either my name or running times, that, that'll pop up. Okay. We'll try to put a link to that in the podcast page. Yeah. And, and so what we're trying to do there is, um, you know, do, do some general strength because if you think about it from a metabolic standpoint, all these elements of triathlon are basically catabolic, meaning tearing down, meaning yep. you're using energy to, to perform the event, but, but you're, you're tearing down, down muscle in, in that. Um, and, and again, you're not like, ripping it apart and losing a pound of muscle <laughs> after <laughs> right. a hard race. But, it, but on the, the cellular level, that's what's going on. So what we want, and you've, you've heard the, all heard this term before, is an anabolic stimulus. So anabolic, you've heard it with steroids. We're, we're not talking about cheating and using steroids, but what we are talking about is anabolic as, a, as the term that means building up. So we want to put some general strength in there to build up that that body. And there's when I spoke at this this clinic this past weekend, this good friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Mezer, who has a PhD in exercise physiology and is mm-hmm. also one of the best high school running coaches in our country, you know, there's good research that shows that you will actually improve VO2 max if you do some strength training after your endurance training. So oh, interesting. That, I'm not familiar with that research. Yeah, so I, I can, can get a hold of Jeff and, and we can uh, refer to that a little bit. But yeah. w- what, what I want to do there is just highlight that coaches have been doing this for years and years and years. Coaches have been putting general strength, and, and these are coaches in, our, in my sport that are maybe more influenced by, by European coaches, but this idea that you do general strength after you're running is very sound. And then yeah. here's the deal. You just have to do it. I mean, you have to <laughs> have to carve out the time and say, I can find 15 minutes of my life to do this work. Yeah. Okay? Then, then another thing I, I really highlight is active, isolated flexibility. Some of you may, you probably haven't seen this in the triathlon world as much. It, it's people in the running world have seen it. It's, it's basically called rope stretching. Yeah, so you, you, um, you had a podcast about that. Yeah, so so my my friend Phil Wharton and his father Jim Wharton have have brought active isolated flexibility into the running world. They've worked with I think a hundred different Olympians in track and field. This rope stretching is just a great way to to you know lengthen muscle and and you know to put it in the most simple terms, it's going to reduce the chance of injury if you do this rope stretching. So mm-hmm. to me, the general strength and the rope stretching are, are, are elemental and strides are elemental. But again, what would I be, you know, if, if I was the, the running coach helping a triathlete, what I'm going to do after the hard running sessions is ask for another 15 or 20 minutes of their time, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes of, of general strength, and then somewhere between five and 10 minutes of active isolated flexibility. Again, to go back to the scientific research, you want to be taking in protein immediately after the run happens. So during this type of work, you can be, be taking your protein shake. Again, my, my friend, Dr. Jeff Mezer showed some very compelling research that shows that bringing in protein actually increases uh, both VO, VO2 max um, over the course of like six or eight weeks. Um, mm-hmm. and, and really what, what that's doing, if you think about it, we're in the business when we're an endurance athlete of making more mitochondria. So yeah. when, when you uh, bring in that protein, you're helping the body make, make more mitochondria. Yet then you also get that when you're doing this general strength, you also get that hormonal stimulus that I'm talking right. about, that anabolic stimulus to, to build right. up the body. And you need to follow it up with a good night's sleep. You, you definitely do. Yeah, you definitely do. <laughs> that's, so. that's probably where I fall short the most is uh, getting consistent good sleep after, yeah. you know, putting all this other work in. 
Yeah. Uh, well, that's really helpful. I, the three things that you highlighted, the general strength, the rope stretching, and the strides, I think those are three things that a triathlete can really take away from your expertise as a run coach. You know, some of the training may look similar and some of the progressions and macro cycles and micro cycles, they're going to have similarities. But when a triathlete is trying to fit in two additional sports, one of which the biking takes proportionally at least twice as much time as the running, depending on what distance you're training for, these three things that you mentioned don't take much time at all. And yet it sounds like they can really improve the running, if not general aerobic fitness, which is going to benefit everything. Yep. Yep. Well, let's talk for a few minutes. You and I are doing a camp together along with Mark Allen and Terry Lachlan in about two months here in Boulder, Colorado. How'd you yeah. get roped into that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm basically the fill-in for Bobby McGee. And, you know, he's obviously well known in, in the world of triathlon. I I definitely don't claim to have the expertise he has working with triathletes. I do think there's just a, a fundamental thing we have in common, which we believe posture and good biomechanics is important for good running. The, mm-hmm. the, the way we go about, about teaching those things is a little bit different. To, to be a little more specific within even the idea of teaching is um, th- this idea of cues, okay? okay? So a cue is something that you give a runner, and a good cue helps that runner correct that problem. Mm-hmm. So a cue I often use is run up tall, okay? Mm-hmm. And I use that cue because so many runners are hunched over. And you talked about it earlier in the podcast where we're yeah. sitting in a car, we're sitting at a desk, we're hunched over a computer. So we, we have the, this this kyphosis in the back where our back is rounded. And I'm, you know, I'm so glad this is an audio podcast and not a video <laughs> podcast because I have the worst posture ever. <laughs> Here I am talking yeah. about posture and how important it is, and I, I have, have, have poor posture. That's funny. So running up tall is a cue I can give somebody in an article for running times, and it's going to help most people. But then Mm -hmm. what we're we're actually going to be able to do in the camp is, you know, I can put my hands on someone's shoulders and push down when they're in kind of their normal posture, and they're going to be very squishy, okay? (laughs) And they're not going to feel very athletic. Well, now Mm -hmm. we get them standing on on their their, – I, was about to, I about said something dumb. Standing on their feet, okay? <laughs> okay. So somebody is standing. <laughs> now, yeah. what we do, though, is have them rock a little, just a little bit forward so they're maybe at a one-degree body lean, mm-hmm. and now they're feeling the weight on the middle of their foot, on their midfoot. Now I press down on their shoulders, and it's a, 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 a rigid body. And mm-hmm. if you think about it, that's what you want when you run. When you put that force into the ground with the foot, you, you know, we all talk about core strength and why it's so important, but part of it is that we want a, a rigid structure so we can keep moving forward. Yeah, so um, you can transmit that energy. Yeah, you know, and just to talk about the camp, so, so we'll do that. We'll do some things that are probably similar to what, what you guys have seen with Bobby in, in his videos with some of the drills. But then where I'll do some different things is I'll, I'll teach everybody the lunge matrix, which I think they should be doing before every for all their runs. Mm-hmm. Um, I would also argue, you know, the athletes can d- decide on this after the camp, but I think they should be doing it b- before they're swimming their bike as well. Because what mm-hmm. the lunge matrix has you doing is moving in all three anatomical planes of motion. Okay. Um, yep. um, and honestly, let, let's not go into that here because that, that, that's a very, very visual thing to understand. But, but sure. then, then we'll do some, some general strength and then we'll, we'll do some, some rope flexibility. And, you know, it, it'll just be a, a very holistic way to say, okay, I'm a runner. What do I need to do before my run? What do I need to do during yep. my run in terms of posture? What do I need to be doing after my run to keep some flexibility and, and, and mobility so that when I get into the pool or on the bike, I'm, I'm not someone that, that's set up for injury there? Yeah, I think that's going to be really fantastic. I was just with Bobby last weekend in Boulder and Simon Martin, he and I helped Bobby coach this camp and we had 22 runners there of all different experience levels and all different body shapes and sizes. And what stood out to me the most is that everyone who came to the camp was already a member of Bobby's uh, website where they have access to him, you know, demonstrating the drills and teaching and education, you know, but you're sitting behind a computer desk watching it on the screen. And some of the people that that came to the camp had not even watched the videos. They wanted to wait and see it in person and then go back and review them. So, you know, people learn in different ways. And this hands-on portion of the camp and actually seeing it and living it and doing it makes such a huge impact 
on yeah. uh, on someone's ability to then execute it and practice and recognize how important and beneficial it can be. Yep, I, I, exactly. Yeah. Great. I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to have, uh, I'm going to have a couple of coaches there with me at the camp who are um, extremely accomplished athletes themselves, but you're also going to have some of your athletes there helping with uh, hands-on coaching. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. These are athletes who are strong, who, who know how to do these drills. So, um, Good. And, and, and some of the drills, I, I mean, I'm going to say, you know, anybody who's serious enough to, to come to this camp has, has Bobby's resources online. So, I'm not going to try and reteach things that they can already get from him, but I mm-hmm. am going to teach some things that'll help. You know, there there's certain drills that we do in track and field that basically help with glute strength, hamstring strength, hip flexor strength, and and so we'll 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 teach some of those drills as well. So yeah. so basically, some things that people can add in to really get strong. That's great. Well, I'm I'm certainly not looking at you as a looking at your participation in the camp as a replacement for Bobby. I'm looking at this as an opportunity to learn from somebody new who's extremely skilled and accomplished in, in his own right. And like I mentioned before, all of us learn from others. You know, you've already, you have already mentioned uh, four or five or six run coaches that you've learned from. So I'm looking forward to your expertise and just adding on to what I already know. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to pass it on to athletes as well. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it as well. So it sh- should be a lot of fun. Well, I appreciate taking time out of your busy day to meet with us, and I I'll guess I'll see you in a couple of weeks, and maybe we can get in touch before then to, to tune up some things for camp day. Okay, great. I, I look forward to meeting you as well, and it's an honor to be, be part of that camp in August. Great. Thanks a lot, Jay. Have a great day. All right. You as well. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's show, please go to iTunes.com and review Triathlon Research Radio so that you can help us share this great information with more triathletes and grow the sport.